other video in which I sit on the tailgate of the P38 for a half an hour and go through a load of invoices and offer some reflections on the maintenance side of the model. In this video I'm just going to take it for a drive, talk a bit about the model in general and how it drives and also point out some things to look for if you're taking one for a test drive. So when you go to start the car as well as listening for a normal engine start also look out for the air suspension rise so this slice at the bottom here will indicate that the suspension is in motion and then it should rise to the normal ride height level fairly quickly and you should get a steady uh, orange light in in that next to that symbol Car's been sitting for a few days, so it shouldn't take very long to rise at all. So the ABS light won't go off until we've started moving, but it should go off after a few hundred yards. And the, um, the brake warning light's just there because the handbrake's on. Right, ABS light's out, all of the lights are out, temperatures are coming up, we're good. If you do have the opportunity to sort of drive the car at low speed initially, or at some point during the drive, have a listen out for sort of drivetrain clunks and clanks. Uh, the drivetrain on the P38 is pretty solid. It's unusual for it to get uh, to give significant issues, and, unless it's you know been really bashed about off road. But you know these things can happen. I mean, I recently discovered with the Classic, for example, that there was a tooth missing from one of the gears in the front diff and corresponding tooth missing from the from the half shaft as well and that had been giving all sorts of weird clunks at low speed and you know jugger through the steering when turning and things like that and what was weird is that it was smooth as silk once you got above sort of 20 miles an hour because i think the the you know the impact of the tooth was obviously just not significant at higher speed but at low speed when there's if you've got a little bit of slack in the drivetrain which inevitably there will be um, anything like that is going to really really play up now the p38 the axles do click or sort of clunk a bit when you're on lock a lot of p38 seem to do this i think again it's just a bit of drivetrain slack and if the car's not exhibiting any other um, symptoms like tire scrubbing or uh, you know jolts through the drivetrain it's probably nothing to worry about so we're just coming along the lane here about 35 miles an hour so at low speed particularly the Bosch Thor cars should feel quite sprightly you know nice and torquey because you've got a, a healthy 400 newton meters of torque um, that comes with 2,600 RPM on the on the later cars, and although 400 newton meters is is obviously not a huge amount by modern standards, 2,600 RPM that is usefully low if you think about it, and that's why um, I'd always recommend you go for the 4.6 with the Bosch system if if you're into towing and stuff because it, it really helps if you're tow towing like you know three tons getting going at low speed it just it just really um makes it a lot easier now the the compromise with uh with the tune and this goes for the gems cars as well but the gems cars uh it's not perhaps quite so pronounced um the compromise is that once you get beyond peak torque it, it the power drops off sorry the torque i should say drops off quite quickly so there's a bit of a sort of a dead zone between 3,000 and I'd say 4,500 RPM where not a huge amount happens. And this can be a little bit frustrating, I'll point this out again when we're on the motorway, this can be a little bit frustrating at higher speeds. But certainly up to about 55, 60 miles an hour, the acceleration feel, should feel good because of that, that torque wave at, at, low, at low, low range. Just coming along, uh, out onto a little country lane and yeah, because the P38 is a body on chassis vehicle, you're always going to get a little bit of sort of pitchiness and, and bounciness on, you know, on more uneven surfaces like you might get on a typical Hampshire country lane. Um, it's to be expected, but it just shouldn't, it shouldn't feel harsh or, or crashy. 
you know, those air springs should do a good job at insulating the body uh, from the road, even if the body itself does kind of rock around uh, quite a bit. Right, so we're warmed up. I've just uh, pulled out onto dual carriageway, so I'm just gonna floor it and just see how the car reacts. steering like excessively tight which obviously you don't want either so um, 
something to look out for anyway. Right, let's have a little run on the M3 here. I'm just gonna again come smartly uh, on down the slip road. criticism really of the, of the P38's brakes is not the brakes itself but just the fact that the the body pitches forward quite a lot under under braking under heavy braking um, so I, I try to do my best when I'm just driving normally not not to late brake because it you know it just makes if you've got anyone in the car it just makes for a very uncomfortable sort of sensation but it will do it throw out the anchors it will stop and it'll stop pretty smartly right 
just going to go into a little car park just to do some low speed manoeuvring, uh, you know, go on full lock and, and can turn a bit um, and that will just check that the viscous coupling isn't seized um, because the transfer case has a viscous coupling attached to it which is what controls the, you know, the, the traction lock between the front and the back axles. Um, but obviously if it seizes up, then that will give you, you know, sort of tire scrubbing and kind of like weird feedback through the, um, you know, through the steering at low speed. And it's not the end of the world, you know, it's probably not in of itself a reason to walk away from a car, uh, because changing the VC is not, you know, a big deal, but, you know, it's possibly a negotiating point. Right, the other things I'm just going to do are uh, check the higher suspension height setting and also check that it goes into low range. So let's see about suspension on click up. good opportunity when it's going up to listen for noise kind of like a rumble from the compressor if you know what to listen for you'll probably always hear it even if it's quiet but sometimes they do rumble excessively which suggests either the mounts in the compressor box need changing or possibly um, the compressor could do with a, a rebuild which again is not a big deal right let's do that let's look at the low range so I'm just going to take the handbrake off so we can see better. So I'm going to come down into neutral to make sure that it's in the detent like that. There's a little bit of play in this in the shifter on this one, which is fine, but you just make sure it's locked in there. And then uh, compress the shift switch again on the knob and go over to the left into neutral. Like that it will beep a few times, and then when it stops beeping, you should see low indicated on the dash. And then just come down into, doesn't matter which gear really, but come down into second, for example, and you should feel a nice positive kind of, you know, thud through the car as that engages. And then just uh, come up here at the dash. So we've got L, we're in second, and just let the car roll forward just a little bit just to make sure that's engaged properly. It's, yeah, that's all good. I'll just go and check that low reverse works. <laughs> Again, it's fine. Back again. And then to go back, reverse, go back into neutral. Make sure that's engaged, it's all good. Come right again. Wait for the beep to stop and we go back into park or drive or whatever. So yeah, that's all fine. Um, I just do that from time to time in this car because it does have a tendency to seize a bit and become very stiff. So I just go in uh, from time to time um, and, and run it through into low range just so that it, you know, it's just so that I know it's working. If it's really stiff, it might just be through lack of, of lack of use. So I've been going for a good 20 minutes now. Obviously you haven't been following me for the entirety of that 20 minutes. And temperature gauge is still planted in the middle. really notice on on really scarred surfaces 
95% of the time it's it's fine. It's you know it's a nice quiet cabin um, without too many sort of squeaks and rattles. I think it's also a bit worse when the car's cold. Sometimes if you come out during the winter and drive the car, when you first set off, there'll be all sorts of noises, not just cabin noises, but also like the big fan noise from the um, from the dash and things like that. And, but normally after 15 minutes driving, a lot of it just evaporates. It's like everything's all warmed up and, and, and stopped kind of squeaking against each other. Let's talk about things that you should probably walk away from and things that are maybe negotiating points. So any suggestion of overheating during the drive is probably not worth further investigation. It could be something simple like new radiator, stuck, stuck thermostat, but it might not be. And even if it's the head gasket and even if the seller's like confident or assertive that that's what it is you don't know how long it's been overheating for and if it's been, because if it's been like that for a very long time you don't know what damage has been done and yes it's it's probably it might be salvageable assuming the block isn't damaged but there are enough out there that don't overheat for it to not really be worth the hassle of investigating one that does air yeah, suspension issues again if it's been converted to springs and you're happy with that, then fine. Uh, some people don't mind the spring setup. I think it kind of ruins the, the, the car, but you know, not everyone agrees with me in that regard. Um, if the air suspension is present but has faults with it, again, it might be something simple. It might not be. Like most air suspension issues are caused by not maintaining the system and not having someone who really knows it diagnose and fix it when it does go wrong. But having said that, there could be parts, time, money involved. And there's still a lot out there that, that are fine and are sorted. So, you know, I, I'd be kind of put off, but it could be a negotiating point. You know, because fundamentally it is a reliable system. You know, this car, three years, uh, 15,000 miles, the suspension has never given me any, any issues. Uh, the compressor just sometimes occasionally gets a little bit noisy, but you can have the, you can have the compressor rebuilt, you can have the valve block in the, in the suspension rebuilt, and again, it's not the end of the world. Um, issues with the height, spent like ride height sensor issues, that sort of thing, they can sometimes get a little bit more pernicious to track down, which is why I would just suggest you know not, not going there. But, uh, weird electrical issues. So, quite often, as I, as I was saying in my other uh, video, quite often weird electrical issues can be caused by body control module, um, the fuse box, or just having a bad battery or an inadequate battery. So, if you see a really nice, you know, thousand cold crank hand cooked battery under the body, you probably, you know, probably know that it's been, well, not only is it being owned by somebody who knows what they're doing. Also, it's unlikely to have a lot of these sort of low-grade electrical issues that um, you know the, the smaller battery may well precipitate. But you know, if it's doing weird things like lots of simultaneously but but theoretically unrelated electrical problems, it could be something simple, but it might not be. You might end up you know tearing your hair out over uh, chasing all these sort of faults down. And again, despite what you despite what you might hear, there are plenty out there that don't do it. Like this one has given very little trouble electrically over the last three years. And I, and I don't think I've just been lucky. I think I've been fastidious. I think previous owners of this car were quite fastidious. And you know, any any suggestion of anything is immediately pounced on and dealt with. And that way they don't accumulate and you know faults don't accumulate and, and, and start you know uh, bouncing off each other so to speak um, so that's again electrical issues steer clear i would say as i was saying earlier most rover v8s north of 100k are going to have you know a bit of camware they probably, 
they would benefit in all likelihood from a bit of head work, you know, valves, that sort of thing, um, just to restore their factory performance. So if the engine's feeling a bit tired, well, first of all, that's probably just normal because no 25, nearly 30 year old Rover V8 with lots of miles on it is going to feel like factory fresh. It's just engines wear out, particularly engines of that age, it's just how it is. Um, but what I would say is you could say that, well, you know, I need a bit of, of, of budget, a bit of latitude to maybe have some head, head, head work done. For example, if the car has never had the head gasket done and it's approaching 150, maybe even more miles, expect to have to have that done probably by 200k. And I would consider having the head gasket done as a bit of preventative maintenance if it hasn't, you know, blown. Just, you know, just to give you the peace of mind because then it's done. You know, it's probably two, maybe two and a half grand job at the most. And then it's done and you could not worry about it for another 10 years. That's probably all I can think of for now. As you can probably tell, I rate the P38. I really like it. I've really enjoyed owning it. I think it's a, it's a really interesting kind of crossover point in, in Land Rover's history because they put an awful lot of effort into making it one of the best, in my opinion, SUVs of the 90s, if not the best, uh, when you take into account its off-road credentials. But it still falls before that kind of point where BMW take over and Land Rover kind of enters the 21st century with the L322 and the Discovery 3 and you know they go over to this kind of hybrid um, you know subframe monocoque kind of arrangement you know it's kind of cross between a Ford monocoque and a, and a ladder chassis um, which I think was the right way for Land Rover to go certainly for the Range Rover at least because with the L322 obviously they managed to, to re retain that gold standard off-roading ability um, and also improve the, the on-road dynamics and if, it, and if you're you know, worried about the on-road on dynamics then I, I would steer you in the direction of the L322 rather than the P38. Um, I like the P38 because it is more DIY friendly, I like the Rover V8 because it's an old school engine that yes is dated but it's easy to work on it's easy to improve. You can't get over its inherent limitations. You're not going to be able to, you know, turn it into an overhead cam engine when it's not. Um, but you can certainly do a lot to make it better. So, uh, you know, I like it in, in, in that regard. It's an old school mechanics engine for sure. Now I could ramble on about the P38 as, as the model and its merits or lack, or lack thereof. But I think I'll just offer this thought, uh, particularly with regard to how it compares with the Lacer Classics. Because I was originally, you know, looking for a late classic really, rather than the P38, when, you know, when I started my search for a classic with a small SUV, with a small C SUV. And I realized at the time, I, I wasn't gonna be able to buy a really reliable classic that didn't need a ton of welding for the sort of money I wanted to spend. So I looked at the P38 and it dawned on me pretty quickly that if you bought a good one, you actually had a considerably better car than a late classic. Now obviously you don't get that sort of classic feel, but then by the end, even the classic itself wasn't feeling so classic anymore because you know that you had luxury pretensions, they put a lot more you know systems on it, air conditioning, ABS, air suspension was an option. Um, the engine management system had become more complex, the more sort of few more ECUs dotted about the car. But from the point of view of like the interior and the drive, I prefer the P38. And it's also proved to be a lot um, more acceptable to my other half uh, because it's a lot more comfortable, it's a lot quieter, it's a lot more refined, particularly on longer journeys at high speed. It, it does the whole luxury refinement thing a lot better than the Classic. Now obviously if you set your heart on a Classic, particularly an early one, you're not going to be interested in the P38 because the, you know, the look is different and it, it has a much more modern feel about it. But it's quite a good compromise between the old and the new and 
I would say if you're considering spending 15, 20, maybe even 25 on a really nice late model classic, and so I'm talking here like 93 through to 96. If you're considering that, just try a P38 that's maybe for sale in the five to eight grand range, you know, like a really nice one that's, you know, got a nice interior, hasn't been bashed about off-road, and hasn't, you know, been thrashed while towing or anything like that, a nice one. Just try and see what you think, because you could buy it for seven, eight grand, and then just put the rest of the money aside for the maintenance fund, and you'll have a really nice car.